Hi, I'm Andy Burnham, Mayor of Greater Manchester, and this is United We Stream, the platform that's been broadcasting northern talent to the world right through lockdown, and thanks to your donations, raising funds for some very worthy causes. We've had some big names on here, Melanie C, New Order, Elbow, Slow Readers Club, but to be honest, I think tonight we've got the biggest lineup of all, and that is down to one of the nation's favourite comedians, John Richardson, who's been going through his phone book and he's lined up a stellar cast for you. And it's all to raise funds for a cause that's very close to his heart, the St John's Hospice, which has been serving the people of North Lanks, South Lakes for many years, as well as NHS Charities Together and the Lancashire Community Foundation COVID-19 Fund, as well, of course, as our usual United We Stream charities. What more reason do you need to donate, but sit back and enjoy what is going to be an incredible night. And I will now leave you in the capable hands of John. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and uh, welcome to this, the creepiest episode of Jack and Ori of all time. Uh, on the background there, you'll see the, the Winter Gardens in Morecambe. That's where I was supposed to be tonight, uh, raising money for St John's Hospice. That went tits up, obviously. So. Uh, we're doing things slightly differently. I am uh, now in an empty theatre space. I'm not going to lie to you, it's not the first gig I've done to no laughs whatsoever, but uh, I hope you are laughing at home and thank you for joining us. We'll be here for about the next two hours, depending on how quickly I talk. Um, and we'll be raising money for some fantastic charities. We're going to start with a song. Uh, I'm pleased to say I've managed to line up a band I first played on Six Music when I used to be a professional DJ. Uh, they used to have comedians on Six Music. We were roundly hated. I played a comedy song every week and nobody liked it. But uh, now I'm in control. So we're kicking off with a band who are phenomenal. They are Lancashire themselves. What I would ask you to do if you haven't been able yet to go to our Just Giving page, uh, the link is online now. If you could go and donate the price of your interval drink, the price of a ticket for tonight's show. I hate uh, people from the telly asking you to give money when they're not. So I have my phone here and I have my wallet. I'm slightly out of breath, I realise now, looking at the feed, because even though we've had weeks to get this ready, I had to run to my dressing room to get those 30 seconds before we started. And as a result, I have not tied my shoelaces or done my trousers up. So it's going to be a big four minutes for me while I do my trousers up and donate as well, so that you can see I'm not taking the mickey and asking you to do something I'm not. We have a phenomenal show ahead. We'll start it with a tune. Please welcome the fantastic Lancashire Hotpots. How are we doing? Internet world. The place that you can be, but you never really go. Like witness. It's a great pleasure to, uh, for me, Bernard Thresher from the Hotpots, forgot to introduce myself then, at Rest at Lads who were, who were going to join us to be doing this, uh, this little thing. Thanks for asking us, John. It's... Uh, it's ever so nice, because to be honest, we've been dead bored. And, uh, and to be doing something for a little bit of charity, we've got St John's Hospice in, in Lancaster, Nordorf Robbins with uh, music stuff, doing some cracking work. And of course, the uh, Lancashire community uh, mm. support and all, all other great charities. And uh, I was thinking about setting one up myself, um, free chips for fathers, but uh, I'm not sure it'll take off. Uh, we're just going to play you a little song, if that's all right. Um, this is, uh, if, if you're from the north, you should probably like this one, and uh, especially the, the Lancashire area. Um, it goes a little something like this. It's called Wheel of the North. One, two, three, four. <laughs> Some 
much more pleasant pace of life. It's absolutely normal, can't you cocker your wife in the north? She is up in the north. Sing it with me. We love the north. It's the place to be. We love the north. It's for you and me. We love the north. Come on up and see us in the north. It's the place of dreams, we love the North The best football teams, we love the North Come on up and see us in the North Yes, it might be cold by a few degrees And it's not recommended to swim in our seas in the North said that I lived in the south and that's wrong mm. Ok, it's just wrong One more time, come on We love the north It's the place to be We love the north It's for you and me We love the north Come on up and see us in the north We love the north It's the place of dreams We love the north The best football teams We love the north Thank you very much. Have a good one. We'll see you later. Ta-ra, cockers! So there we go. That's, uh, that's the Lancashire Hot Pots. I think that's kicked off the evening beautifully. Um, I hope you're watching from uh, all over, not just the county, but the world. So if you're outside of Lancashire, you're more than welcome. And to illustrate who we have watching this evening and the technology that is possible here and wouldn't be possible if I were anything to do with this, we now have some of the people watching us uh, on screen there so this is our zoom room of people uh, who are watching the show and I'm drawn instantly to a woman who I mean she was fine until a minute ago and has managed to flip herself upside down and doesn't know what to do about it so you're making me feel better about the fact I haven't got trousers done up <laughs> you're drinking lime juice and you've done that wow I mean, it's great to see for those outside the county what a lancastrian ceiling looks like um, very similar to ones you'd find in yorkshire or scotland um, and i love your artwork there i think you're clearly a gifted artist what um, what's your name Nicola. Nicola. Hello, Nicola. Thank you for joining us. Um, do you want? To, do you have a question you want to ask me, or is it merely a matter of sort of interior decorating you need? Or? <laughs> What's the weirdest thing you've ever seen in anybody's home? What's the weirdest thing I've ever seen in anybody else's home? In anybody else's home. Wow. Well, you've sort of misjudged me there, uh, Nicola, as someone who gets invited to other people's homes. And uh, <laughs> I don't know if you're aware of my work, but I'm quite an unpopular person. I'm not the sort of person you want in your living room, put it that way. I always think the weirdest thing is um, if people have pictures of themselves. And uh, I, I'm hoping that's... Is that a picture of you on the wall there? Um, there's, there's a picture painted by my oldest son when he was about two on the walls. Lovely. Yeah. And is it you? It is me. I yeah. don't think that counts. I think when I said that, I was picturing like a grand portrait that you've had done by an artist that sort of stares people down when they come in. But um, I, I wave not? to you all. Uh, thank you so much for uh, joining tonight and for me. I'm sorry I don't get to talk to you all, but perhaps we'll talk afterwards. We'll see how the next two hours goes. And if you still want to talk to me, perhaps we'll get to chat another time. And uh, if you want me to talk to you next time, I would recommend you have some sort of technical meltdown just before we go on air and flip yourself upside down. I could have claimed you, Nicola, as our first viewer from Australia, um, but I wasn't quick enough. Them. Lovely. Well, uh, thank you all for joining. Um, you can uh, tweet as we have our own Twitter account. You can get in touch various ways uh, this evening through the next two hours. We have... I, I, I could list the names we have, but I would just forget people and offend them. We've got some of the biggest comics. We've got globally renowned sports stars. I can't tell you how much we've got. We're going to start with a message from one of the biggest stars of the region. She's a star of Coronation Street, Scarborough, Strictly Come Dancing, of course. Uh, and after that, you're going to hear from one of our first charities this evening because uh, we're about to welcome the wonderful Kath Tildesley, who is quite open, as she has been in the press recently, about how difficult she's found lockdown. It's a wonderful, funny message, and there's a heartfelt message at the end where she talks about um, 
family she's known that have been treated by the NHS at the moment. So after that, you'll hear uh, a poem. It's the only video tonight that isn't ours. Uh, it's a poem you may have seen online praising uh, the NHS, the nurses and doctors. And one of our charities tonight is a, is a national charity. Uh, it's NHS Charities Together. So it felt fitting to hear from them and celebrate them uh, after the work of the wonderful, please welcome Kath Tildesley. Hello everybody, it's Catherine Tilsley here. Hello John, thank you for having me. As you can see, she's bobbed her face on for the first time in many, many weeks. I said to my husband Tom last night, I was like, oh, might shave my legs tomorrow. He was like, oh, that'll be nice, babes. You know, shave my legs for an Instagram live, not shaved them for weeks for my husband. But that's nice, it makes you feel better, doesn't it? It's the small things on lockdown. That's what I've come to learn that really cheer me up, such as shaving my legs. Feels like I'm making an effort. So when lockdown first came around, it wasn't ideal because we were one day into filming a new drama, so that was nice. But I must admit, I haven't stopped since last year, since before I did Strictly. It's been pretty manic and um, it was quite nice to slow down the pace for a few weeks, I'm not gonna lie. It was really lovely to be at home with my boys and, and spend some really good quality time with them. And initially, we were all over this lockdown. We were like, we thought we were Bear grills, stroke the good life. We were constantly in the garden. We were landscaping the garden. I poop you not, we were landscaping the garden. Obviously, I didn't have nails at that point. I'd clearly lost my mind. And we'd been planting vegetables. So we, we try and plant a few vegetables each year, but this year we've gone all out. I mean, to the point where we're going to be giving Sainsbury's and Tesco a run for the money. Um, however, we've planted vegetables and the squirrels keep coming and taking the potatoes. Now, I don't begrudge anybody food, especially carbs, but when I've worked this hard on my garden, I do begrudge those cheeky squirrels coming to get my potatoes. So John, if you've any tips, anybody, if anybody's got any tips on how to keep squirrels off my spuds, please let me know. Everything else is growing like a dream. Lettuces, broccoli, carrots, radishes. And I've actually really enjoyed it. I've really enjoyed gardening and I never thought I'd say that. I've baked maybe six sourdough loaves in the time that I've been on lockdown. Three of them were a disaster, but that's fine. Very difficult to make sourdough. I don't know if you've ever done it, but you have to, you make what's known as the starter first, and that takes days in itself. My mum and dad were telling me there's a starter in Italy. Obviously you use the starter each time you make a loaf. And um, apparently their starter in Italy has been going for a hundred years. Now, I know sourdough does have a fermentation process, but that to me is a little bit minging. What else have I been doing? Homeschooling, which has driven me to a gin and tonic by three o'clock most days. Don't normally drink, I'm not going to lie. Homeschooling's horrendous. I love my child dearly, but it has pushed me to the edge. Um, Mum's loads better. Mum was in ICU. That was horrendous. That was, I mean, I've had mild anxiety in the past, but that was something else. Um, and the things that she saw in ICU, as you can imagine, she saw miracles, but she saw some seriously heartbreaking stuff. So we feel incredibly lucky that we brought my mum home. Granddad's still in there, which is heartbreaking. They've decided they won't resuscitate if he leaves us. So it's incredibly difficult for us as a family. But we're trying our best, like everybody else. I'm a firm. Can do. Just keep trying to be and show each other the love and for the love of God let's keep hold of this beautiful sense of community that we've got that we've got every Thursday on our doorsteps I'm really hoping 
that we keep hold of that. We've had neighbours that we've never met before come round and, and drop us loaves of bread and, and lovely cards and little bits of chocolate and sweets. And, and that side of things has been an absolute joy. I'm really hoping that we continue with that moving forward. So although it's been hard, going slightly crazy, I do believe that there's a lot of silver lining coming out of this year lockdown, babes. John, you're a legend. Thank you so much for having me. Mwah. I'll tell you a tale that's been recently written of a powerful army so great it saved Britain. They didn't have bombs and they didn't have planes. They fought with their hearts and they fought with their brains. They didn't have bullets armed just with a mask. We sent them to war with one simple task, to show us the way to lead and inspire us to protect us from harm and fight off the virus. It couldn't be stopped by our bulletproof vests. An invisible enemy invaded our chests. So we called on our weapon, our soldiers in blue. All doctors, all nurses, your country needs you. We clapped on our streets, hearts bursting with pride as they went off to war while we stayed inside. They struggled at first as they searched for supplies, but they stared down the virus in the whites of its eyes. They leapt from the trenches and didn't think twice. Some never came back, the ultimate price. So tired, so weary, yet still they fought on as the virus was beaten and the battle was won. The many of us owe so much to so few. The brave and the bold are heroes in blue. So let's line the streets and remember our debt. We love you, our heroes, lest we forget. Uh, that's a video uh, in honour of one of the charities we're supporting tonight, which is NHS Charities Together. I don't think I need add any more to the pantheon of voices that have said what phenomenal work is being done. And tonight's all about uh, celebrating more than anything the things that bring us together, as Joe Cox said, rather than what divides us. Uh, we'll, we'll have a lovely evening. Things will go wrong, uh, for which I'll apologise now. If there's any technical difficulty this evening, I'll say sorry, because I think it's important to say sorry if you've done anything that might have upset people and I feel that's an important message today as well. Uh, thank you to the people who've already tweeted to say they're watching. Uh, we've celebrated the NHS there and we have uh, a community midwife, Sarah uh, in Lancaster, she's watching. Uh, Lizzie has uh, tweeted in to say her dad probably won't get to see the hot pots live again uh, but he's got to see them in the living room thanks to this show. That's exactly what it's for so as I will keep saying we're closing in on 20,000 already. If you can get us past 20,000 that will be a phenomenal start to our evening and uh, as you go through the evening we'll find out some of the charities uh, we're here for. Kath mentioned love in her video. It's, um, it's not something I've discussed in my work, mainly sort of passive aggressive comments to my wife about the dishwasher. But love is a key message and we're about to hear from someone who is not from our region originally but has been brought here by love. Uh, we're about to hear the fantastic Russell Kane, who has moved here uh, to be with his partner and he's making some adjustments. And since his video leads on nicely to it, uh, we have the wonderful uh, AJ Dudu, who's a presenter that some of you will know, uh, and she's from Blackburn as well. So some massive laughs coming. Please welcome Russell Kane and AJ. Hi, Russell Kane here, and I am in a mixed relationship. I'm married to a girl from Manchester. Now, I know what you're thinking. Come on, man. It's just two hours on the train from London to Manchester. How different can it be? The cultural chasm has taken some time to adjust. Now, Lindsay, that's my wife's name, Lindsay. If you're from North Manchester, Lindsay is from Sale. So her and her mum say they're from Cheshire. I'm from Sale in Cheshire. 
Mm, it's in Manchester now. I'm from Cheshire. Check your postcode, you lying cow. M33. Sometimes when I'm over at their house, I actually circle the M33 bit of their postcard just to mock her and underline the word Greater, Greater Manchester. I'm from Cheshire. They're all from Cheshire till they've had their third drink and then they're, come at me, I'll take your head off. I'm from Denton. I love, what do I love about the fact that I now live in the Northwest? I love the confidence up here. Uh, we've got a daughter now. So to me, female confidence is a massive thing. And I love how women just tell you their mind up here. I'm going to tell you what I think, then you're going to think it. Excuse me, Lindsay thanks herself. You'll do as I say, thank you. There's no one there. Thank you. Who are you talking to? It's a little bit scary. Thank you. Thank you. But there's a tiny assistant behind her. They pluralise themselves as well, women up here. Don't tell us what to do. Not me. I'm from Essex. Don't tell me what to do. Not in the North West. Don't tell us what to do. Us. How many women are in there? More than you can handle, mate. Sally can wait. I will look back in anger, bastard. Champagne. Supernova. Uh, what's taken time to adjust to? I mean, most of it's positive, to be honest. I'm from the South, where we just keep ourselves to ourselves. And the friendliness can be slightly unnerving at, at first. I mean, I love my family and where I'm from, but down south, if we wanted help with the baby, it would be arranged in advance. Appointments would be made. You let people know you're coming over and there's always a reason, a purpose, an errand or an event. Whereas you're up north, you just pop in. You kick the door in and you pop in. My, my spare room is never empty here. Well, it is during lockdown, but you get what I'm saying. Sometimes I'll come down the stairs. Who are you? I'm Lindsay's cousin Barry. I'm making some toast. Don't go in your toilet. I've had a shite. It stinks in there. Nice to meet you. Shake me hand. No, thank you. But it's great. The benefit to that is once you have a baby, you can throw a baby up in the air. Boom. A cousin's arm catches it. Boom. An auntie catches it. We can get a date night whenever we want because we all live together in our happy house. A um, couple of things I refuse to adjust to. I'm not, I know this is for a very good cause and I'm not trying to put negative vibes in the air but I'm sorry I will not call my lunch my dinner dinner as every civilized human being knows is taken in the evening and me and my father-in-law <laughs> genuinely uh, can't communicate do you want to come over for dinner tomorrow no I can't I'll still be at work no dinner yeah I know I'm at work during dinner time no you're not dinner time's at 6 p.m isn't it hang the phone up lose my temper how do you explain dinner ladies then? Explain a dinner lady. A dinner lady tends to you at lunchtime. All right. That does sort of prove your point. And um, I feel, do I go there or not? It's a tricky subject. Fish and chips. I queued up for one of my first fish and chip meals when I was up here. And, you know, I mean, my friends from Essex think I'm making this up. But I was actually asked at the end of my meal. Would you like gravy with your chips on? Now, I was sick in the restaurant. I was sick. First of all, I thought it was a joke. Would you like gravy? Chips. How can I explain this to you? Chips are the crispier the chip, the better it is. Right? A nice, crisp, light chip. Why would you want to soak it with gravy? Do you want brown fluid all over your potatoes so you can turn it into mash that looks like a dog shite? I'm not 70. I'm not 80 years old. I've got teeth. Can you turn it into mush for Nana, please? Nana needs her chips turned into mush. I never heard the worst bit was at the end. Before you leave, for a pound, would you like any scraps? Excuse me? Oh, look. That's how angry I was. My eyes fell out, which I've just dramatised by my camera falling to the floor. Would you like any scraps? I, just, I was like, there must be someone, you know, who needs my help behind me. A pound for a scrap. No, she was offering to sell me the dust from the bottom of the chip top counter for a pound in a bag. That's why I want to help the Northwest. Stop selling each other the dust from the chip shop in a bag for a pound. Let's do what we can to make that stop. Right, I've got to go now. Lindsay's going to tell me what to do. I'll do what I like, Shite. Thank you. Look in my eyes. Don't tell us what to do. Bastard. Hiya, AJ Dudu here, and you may recognise me from Channel 4's Celebrity SAS Who Days Wins, or Man Hunting with My Mum, or Backstage at The Voice UK, or you might not recognise me at all, in which case, hiya!
Welcome to my kitchen and I just want to take you on a very short trip down memory lane for me personally because I was born and raised in Blackburn, Lancashire to two Nigerian parents and through them I have had the pleasure of trying so many culinary delights, things full of flavour, spices, colour, texture, you name it, I've tried it and today I want to show you one of my all time favourite dishes to cook. It's really quick, it's really simple, it's full of flavour and it's absolutely delicious. So, here's what you will need. Chips, cheese and gravy. Bosh. Mm, 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 mm. Compliments to the chef. You can't do better than that. Um, I want you all to know I've reached out to Russell since his upsetting video and I've explained to him that the scraps are the crispy texture that he's looking for. So you apply the gravy, of course you do. And then the scraps give you that crunch. They are the, the crouton, if you will, in the soup. So he's been educated. You don't have to tweet him abuse. Uh, he now knows. Um, we're having some lovely messages in. Uh, we've got one food related, but in terms of arms across the Pennines, uh, we've had a message from LUFC Keith, uh, a Leeds fan. Uh, who says, come on everybody, let's get together and make this a success it deserves to be. And I can't speak more highly than that than to say, that's right, let's all get our arms together. Not to undermine the work of people from Leeds, but Rob has also tweeted in who's watching from Melbourne, Australia. So by my maths, I think he's got up at about five o'clock in the morning. And uh, I can only speak for myself, but I'm not funny until at least seven o'clock with a few beers inside you. So I admire your commitment, Rob. He's also donated. Thank you very much. We're at about £17,500, which is absolutely phenomenal. I can't thank you all enough. The, the credit, the comedians have done great work, some of the people we've got, but I'm, I'm so aware it's your money that is why this night will be a success. So thank you for every donation. And Anya has taken some of the pressure off. She's tweeted me a picture of her. She's watching this in her garden. Uh, eating toasted marshmallows so that makes me feel some somewhat more relaxed uh, we're going to talk more uh, about food now uh, of course the trip started uh, in Lancashire the inn at Whitewell um, we have phenomenal chefs right across the region we have one now if you're getting a bit peckish if it's snack time uh, here's an idea here's uh, a recipe from one of the many Michelin starred chefs we have probably one of the nicest this is Lisa Allen Hello everyone, I'm Lisa Goodwin Allen, I'm the Executive Chef of North Kerry in the River Valley and I'm going to show you how to make one of Lancashire's favourite treats, an Eccles cake. Okay, so the first step I'm going to do is marinate the currants. So I have some fine currants, some strong brewed Lancashire tea, a little bit of sugar, some lime zest, and some lime juice. Put it all in that and give it a good mix. So we take the dish of pastry, put in the currants in the middle. I'm going to form them up like little parcels so that the currents are completely sealed in the centre. Give them a really good pinch. And then we pop them into some sugar. So once they're completely coated in sugar, pop it into a mould, use your thumb to press down so you're getting a nice even shape. You could simply just do this in your hands. Pop them onto the tray. Homemade apples cakes, delicious. So John, I'm gonna send you some of these, but I know you probably can't eat them because you're vegan, uh, but let's see what everyone else thinks. Hi John, it's Mrs. Falker here of the St. Thomas Lancaster. Hope you can catch. Oh, hello from everybody in Fleetwood. No problem Lisa, we'll get it to John. Hi John, it's Emma here. I'm just wishing you all loads of luck tonight, raise lots of money, and here's your record. Woo! <laughs>
Thanks, Lisa. That looks delicious. Um, I, I can't eat that. Um, not necessarily because I'm vegan, but because so many people have touched it and now it's in shards all over the floor. But I have brought, I made these myself this morning, a particular Lancashire delicacy. These are uh, Lancashire black peas. So uh, people from the region will know what I'm talking about. I'm about to open these. I know we are socially distancing at the moment. I think probably even Rob in Australia will get a whiff of these when I open up. They're, they're a real delicacy. They're a sort of uh, a black, I don't know if you can see inside there. Um, you cook them down for between four to five years. Um, there we go. And uh, they're best served hot. Uh, these have been in this uh, child's flask now for about six hours. So they're about ready to go. And this is the, this is the smell and taste to me of um, Trimple Golf Club. This is the food I was uh, served whilst watching my Nana Gwen and Grandad Ron bowling back when I was a blonde, curly haired young boy who was told week in, week out he was the prettiest girl at bowling. And that did so much for my self esteem. So you apply uh, malt vinegar as much as you can, uh, as much as you can stand, a bit of white pepper, traditionally eaten on um, bonfire night. Um, let's get a good look at that. And uh, I'm going to eat these, they're going to go inside me. I know they are. I, do, I honestly think they're delicious. I got the bag out to cook these last night. You leave them in soak. And uh, my wife said, oh God, what are you doing that for again? She's not a fan. I've got to admit, they're not for everyone. But I think that's a good thing. Um, they shouldn't be for everyone. So we now have a collection of videos from people who aren't from Lancashire, but have come to us and had some of the defining uh, periods of their life. I, I didn't get their opinion on black peas. I'm going to assume some of them aren't fans. They're all absolutely phenomenal and they're going to talk to you about some of the things they've seen um, on their time with us, some studying, some living, but please welcome some of the best comedians in the country. Hello, uh, the people of Manchester and surrounding areas, uh, Josh Riddicum here. I just wanted to say um, I spent four years of my life in Manchester and they were four of, I mean, my wife's not listening, so they were the best four years of my life. It was brilliant. Best place I've ever lived. Wonderful place to be a student. Wonderful drink steals in Scream pubs. Wonderful a Domino's where it was one ninety five for a small cheese and tomato. You can't argue with stuff like that. It's a wonderful city. A huge culture shock from Devon. Uh, but, you know, little boy in the big city, I made it work. One thing, I do think you need to make more of the fact Stone Roses are from there. Because it's barely mentioned. I loved my time at the University of Central Lancashire in Preston. I worked hard at university, but I also played hard. That's one of my favourite cliches, because it was just so true. I loved going out with my new friends. In fact, I was out nearly every night. I just couldn't get enough of my newfound freedom. Tokyo at Joe's was the place every student went on a Wednesday night. It was your typical cheesy nightclub. It had a shit name, Sticky Carpets, and played everything from steps to oasis. Looking back now, it was distinctly average at best. But when you're a young student surrounded by all your mates, a club like that seems the best place in the world. But there was one problem when I went out clubbing with my mates. On a night out, people always assumed that I must be drunk because I couldn't walk very well. I do struggle to walk in a straight line and I look very wobbly even when I'm stone cold sober, so it was an easy mistake to make. But I actually walk this badly all the time. One particular instance of being refused entry to Tokyo Joe's sticks in my mind. I had agreed to meet my friends inside. But when I got to the front of the queue, the doorman wouldn't let me in. He claimed I was too pissed. Of course I tried to argue my case, but it certainly didn't help that I couldn't talk either. You try telling a bouncer you're not drunk when you can't form a sentence and you keep drooling on their shoulder. Eventually, I did make him realize the error of his ways, and he finally figured out that I was just disabled and not an absolute pisshead. 
He seemed very embarrassed when it dawned on him, and he waved me in straight away. I couldn't resist one last dig, though. As I walked past him and into the club, I typed, You'll know when I'm really drunk because I'll have to sit all over my shoes. I'll be trying to chat up a self-service checkout, and I'll be walking in a straight line. I never had any trouble getting into Tokyo Joe's ever again. Hello, it's Alan Carr here. How are you all doing? This lockdown's dragging. Honestly, it's making me well vex. Listen, I just wanted to send you a quick video to say have a great night tonight. It's been organised by the one and only John Richardson and I hope you raise lots of money for those local charities. Um, he asked me to send in a video and have some of my thoughts about the North West. Well, as you know, I lived up there for six years in Stratford. The drum pub was me local. I got thrown out of it once for asking for a rosé. But anyway, let's not dwell on that. It's where it all started for me, stand-up comedy-wise. Uh, the Buzz in Chawton, which is there no more. I worked at Bartley Card, opposite the library. That's not there no more. I'm beginning to take it personally. <laughs> but anyway, listen, I always have the best time up there. The people are wonderful. I'm not going to lie. I've never had my car broken into so many times. But hey, love you, Manchester. Have a great night tonight. And you know what? This lockdown isn't going to last forever. We've got, to, we've got to keep positive. And I hope you raise lots of money tonight. Bye. Thank you, Alan. Thank you, Josh. Uh, thank you to Lee uh, for a particularly poignant reference for uh, people my age who grew up where I did to Tokyo Joe's. Uh, anyone with memories of Tokes, not necessarily for the show, I might not read it out, but I'm collating them uh, for an upcoming court case. Uh, if you want to send me any memories you have of Tokes, I'll share them with my friends and that'll be your gift to us for our next uh, boozy Zoom chat together. If you want to speculate on what the worst nightclub might be, uh, in the county or indeed beyond, then send those uh, to the Twitter page, uh, which is at no audience John R. We've had a message from somebody who says, I haven't got Twitter. And I must admit, I'm slightly uh, naive to the fact that there are many ways you can watch and get in touch. So I apologize if I've plugged uh, those outlets too much. She says, I don't have Twitter. Could you say a huge happy 50th to my wonderful mum, who is the best mum and grandma and is really helping us during lockdown? It's not the birthday she was planning, but we'll make the best of it. Take care. Stay safe. And that comes in from Hannah McGranahan. And if that's not a made up name, then it's the best name I've ever heard. So I'm going to play you some more videos shortly. I hope you enjoy watching them. I'm going to write as many lyrics as I can. Uh, to a limerick that starts, there once was a lady called Hannah McGranahan. Um, and I hope at one stage in my life to meet Hannah McGranahan. <laughs> I can't stop saying Hannah McGranahan. Anyway, um, we have a number of comics in our region. Some of them will be obvious to you, but we have just an outstanding uh, network of clubs and comedians. And it's how any comedian that you see on the telly becomes the finished package, is gigging around where they live. And so I want this not to be open just to comedians that you may have already heard of, but some that you might not have to this point. And we have some excellent comics in our region who you're going to hear a, a short package of now. There are people in there, obviously, that you will have heard of. Uh, we've got Justin Morehouse coming up, uh, star of Phoenix Nights, wonderful man. Uh, we have uh, these comments, I want you to see them. I want you to promise me that when they make you laugh, and they will, you're going to Google them and you're going to follow them. And when lockdown ends, which it will, and the good times come back, seek them out, go and see them live in clubs. That's where all the best comedy happens. Um, you're going to see, first of all, Harriet Dyer, who is a fantastic comic. Uh, she's already helped me out with another charity event. She's a good person. And she, more than anyone I've seen recently, from the minute she starts talking, you are in her world. Uh, so we've got a few great messages coming up. Please enjoy. You know, just took about bloody 20 selfies thinking I was recording a video. Hello, Marriott Dyer. Hope you're all right. Wearing a fleece. This guy here, this house, prick he is, reckons he needs six car park spaces. I don't think so. Six space, Steve. Anyway, I hope you're all right. My, uh, my first experience of Manchester was, sorry for a call, you see. Uh, Jodas, no, don't turn it off. Uh, when I, when I was a young wild hog, when I was young, well, 17, when I was in Cornwall, I went out with this guy from Manchester, 
and he was very skinny, very hairy, so we called him the pipe cleaner. And my brother would say that he um his accent sounded like you're being chased by electric clippers. Like uh, I don't know if I said look at that. Yeah, half my tooth. It's come out, you see. Awful business. Yeah. Was he in the uh, rice from the Chinese? And I was like, bloody hell, I don't think they've cooked this properly. Turned out I was eating my tooth. Yeah, terrible. Anyway, sorry, that's, this isn't comedy, is it? <laughs> uh, so, I, uh, oh, well, he turned out to be a right old prick, to be honest. But it's weird, though, because he lived in Cornwall for a lot of his life, and I still, now that I have lived in Manchester, still never met anyone on, like with a mankier accent than, than him. Do you know what I mean? But you don't lose it, some accent. Anyway, so then, when I was... Oh, I think it was 2000 and... Well, you weren't 2000. No, do you know what I mean? When, uh, in 2013, I moved to Manchester. Oh, I love it. I love it, I do. Yeah, lovely. And even this is uh, how lovely I loved it. <laughs> is that I live by Strange Ways Prison. I still loved it. I remember once the whole street was um, shut down. I couldn't even walk down the street. Contraband. A lot of contraband. No, not contraband. Cont. Fit. Counterfeit. Yeah, lots of. Uh, anyway, I'm no snitch. Uh, so, in conclusion, I am a massive fan. Wow, you see, not then I met a. Uh, uh, oh, a lovely chap. Uh, the first guy that I didn't sort of just let the crazy out in bits. And he didn't. He didn't run. That was lovely. Yeah, lovely chap. And he's now my fiance. Uh, don't say fiance because I think it sounds wanky. K, <laughs> like Michael Bublé's Bubble Michael, wind your neck in. Do you know what I mean? Anyway, what's my point? Uh, we now, wow, it's a bit of a grey area now because I've been here since a oh, very long time. I love it, absolutely love it. But now I live with him from Manchester. I live him, I live him, I live him. <laughs> I live with him in Glossop, and it's a tricky one that one because it's a Stockport postcode, but. Countless Derbyshire, very confusing, you see. So I hope I'm still, uh, because I feel it in my heart, and I and because I'm with him, I still got a bit of Manchester in me. Uh, mm, yeah, mm. Uh, <laughs> so and then these kids, see, they live with us now. I won't tell you why it's quite depressing. Um, but we'll have a lovely life, and them running around like lots of little me. No, but yeah, so love it, I do. Uh. Thank you. <laughs> All the best in your endeavours. And happy this guy. If you ever meet him, just give him a piece of my mind. Thank you. Brilliant. Uh, you are. And all that sail in her. Really appreciate you and your families. Thank you. Hello, everyone. My name's Dan Nightingale. I just want to explain the backdrop. It feels weird to be wearing my gig hat. This is my gig hat. This is what I wear when I'm gigging, and I've not been doing many of the uh, the live gigs. I mean, the backdrop is because I've got a podcast. It's called Have a Word. Please do check it out. So we've had this set up pre-Rona shutdown, so that's why I'm beautifully lit. And I'm not just taking this video dead, dead seriously and, and putting a backdrop together. We've been doing this stuff already. It feels weird to stick the hat on. I don't. I just haven't been wearing it not been doing any live stream gigs i just it's like dancing without the music not gonna do it the the reason i wear the hat is because i'm bald and um it, it's it's just a mechanism to stop audience members telling me who i look like which is a weirdly acceptable thing if you're a white bloke if i was from an ethnic minority it, it's more culturally sensitive but as i'm a white bloke no one can be racist towards me. That's the rules of racism. White on white doesn't count. But when you're bald and you're white and you wear these glasses, and I know I'm from Lancashire, but people love telling you who you look like and where you're from. The worst one was when an audience member told me I look like a Danish sex offender. That was brutal because I sort of knew what she meant. Like I, <laughs> like I know I'm from West Lancashire, but if you're someone like, have you ever been to this part of Copenhagen? No? So, feels weird to uh, be doing sort of material.
we really are from um, we really are from West Lancashire as well. We uh, I'm from Preston. My dad lives in Tarleton. Sister's still in Penn with him, and we traced our family back on Jeans Reunited. I don't know if you've tried that, and if you've not, and you're from Lancashire, and you're thinking, oh, I'll find out where we're from. D- maybe leave an air of mystery around it because it can be quite depressing once you find out. My uh, stepmom did it, which is really trying too hard. Wonderful woman. She was like, I wonder where we all. I wonder where we go back to. I was like, 2001, when you married dad. <laughs> That's my guess. <laughs> I hope she doesn't see this. Uh, yeah, we got back to 1650. Ginger United got us all the way back to 1650, the Nightingales. And do you know where, where they were? My bloodline, my heritage. All, all that time ago, I'll tell you. Eight miles from where I was born and raised. I just... Woo! Of all the places. Of all the... Potential excitement. It was Salmsbury, slightly down the road on the way to Blackburn. In 300 and what, 50, 370 years, the Nightingales have managed to do what nowadays people can do in a medium sized bike ride. That's 370 years ago. Where do we want to go? What long term? Over there? Very slowly, mind you. Ah, so that was, that's just my bit. Have a listen to the podcast. Stay safe. Enjoy the rest of the shutdown. See ya. Hi everybody, I'm just in my house and I'm in my favourite place in Greater Manchester. I'm on top of the beautiful Werneth Low, uh, which normally I'd be showing you scenes at the city centre, but it's too windy up there. So uh, John's asked me to uh, tell a few showbiz tales from on top of a hill. I have to wait for it because it's a bit windy. Pause recording. Hello, so we've had to come inside because it was really windy. Uh, showbiz tales from top of a hill, but now moved inside the house. My favourite story of comedy clubs in Manchester, the Frog and Bucket, absolute legend of a club, an institution. And uh, it's on the corner of Oldham Street and Ancoats. And uh, it was there before the Northern Quarter was groovy, really. And uh, a few years ago, about 15, 16 years ago, a promoter called Alan Anderson asked me to do something. And looking back now, I shouldn't have done it. He asked me to do a gig round the corner from the Frog and Bucket on their patch. It was at Dry Bar, uh, the famous uh, Dry Bar. And uh, I, I think it was a fundraiser or something. It was a great night. It was me, Alan was on, um, Mick Ferry and Owen Rankin and Peter Slater were doing their Doctor Strange Hair uh, sketch group, which was a uh, legend of the time. And the late, great, brilliant, much-missed Frank Sidebottom. Anyway, the gig was fine. It was good. And we finished, and as we came out, we we noticed there was a bit of a commotion uh, going on uh, as uh, representatives of the Frog and Bucket had taken umbrage with the fact that we were doing a gig on their patch and they were having words with the promoter, Alan Anderson. I've said his name enough times now, so everybody knows it was him who booked the gig, not me. Anyway, Dave Perkins was there. Dave, lovely fella, owner of the uh, Frog and Bucket. Bears some passing resemblance to Den Perry. DP, Dave Perkins, DP, Den Perry. From Phoenix Nights, the camel coat, the cigar, everything. And he wasn't happy. And there was a row going backwards and forwards. And it was a fair point he was trying to make. It was his patch. He was putting a comedy night on around the corner. He was, you know, that sort of stuff. And as Alan was trying to explain, it was a one-off night or whatever, uh, Dave said a, a phrase that really I bet he regrets now. He says to Alan, hey, I'm the king of ankles, the king of ankles. To which Mick Ferry burst out laughing and said, well, I'm the Duke of Deansgate. And then Owen Rankin, still perhaps one of the funniest ad libs I've ever heard, says, I'm Dick Withington. Made me laugh anyway. My third my other showbiz story uh, uh, concerns um, the, the, another institution club, the Phoenix Club. I was so lucky to get a small part in something that people absolutely love, Phoenix Nights. I played John Kenny. And my favourite memory of filming that, lots of great memories. It was such a special time uh, for me and a real help for me in my career. But one of my favourite memories is the episode where we're doing Stars in Their Eyes or Talent Trek, I think uh, they called it. And we were all, uh, not Talent Trek, um, anyway, Stars in Their, whatever it was. And we were all dressed up as uh, different people. Daniel Kitson played uh, somebody he shouldn't have done. Uh, Archie Kelly uh, as Kenny Senior. Brittany, never to be forgotten. 
and that I was going to be meatloaf. Now, for my entrance, if you've never seen Phoenix Nights, I'll bring you up to speed. I spent most of the second series with my face painted like a tiger, and I used to ride a moped delivering Chinese food dressed in a kimono. You don't need to know. Anyway, so for my grand entrance as meatloaf, I would drive my moped down the street, into the club, into the concert room, onto the stage, we take the uh, helmet off, and I was meatloaf. Anyway, it all went fine in the afternoon. We filmed it, and the cameras were all set up where the audience sit. Did it. It was good. It was funny. It was funny, I think. Uh, in the evening, they film it slightly differently. They film it the other way around, so you can see uh, the audience. Um, so it's the audience's reactions. That's what they film in the evening with real people. And they said to me, Justin, you can't ride the moped in tonight because uh, it's health and safety, the public are in. I said, well, what are we going to do? They said, well, we've got a stuntman. I said, a stuntman? They said, yeah, we've got you a stunt double. And I was like, this is the greatest thing that's ever happened to me. A stunt double. Let me meet him. I met him. He was terrific. A good looking fella, quite posh, called Rupert. I mean, that kind of posh, you know, where people from the north think that everyone from down south is posh. Probably just a southerner. But to me, he was posh. Called Rupert. He had a wavy kink in his hair and he was an all action uh, stuntman. He worked on Harry Potter films and uh, James Bond. Uh, and now he was going to be my stunt double. I spent most of the afternoon introducing him to everybody. Ah, this is uh, Rupert. He's my, he's my stunt double. Do you, oh, do you, do you not have a stunt double? Oh, right, okay. I'm, this is Rupert. He's my stunt double. I probably got slightly big-headed with it all. Nothing brings you down to earth than when you see your stunt double in the costume department having two large pillows gaffer taped to his middle so he could be my stunt double. Have a great night, and I hope you raise lots of money for such worthy causes, and uh, you're looking after yourselves during lockdown, and uh, I, I'm, I'm looking forward to watching it myself. See you later. Bye-bye. Hello, my name is Rachel Fairburn, and I am a stand-up comedian from Manchester. I was born in Harper Hay, and I was brought up on the Harper Hay Blakely border. So what you used to do when you were a bit younger, if you wanted to impress someone, you just said you were from Blakely because it's a little bit posher. Um, but I'm definitely from Harper Hay, and if you've ever been to Harper Hay, we have all the things that if somebody wanted to write a stereotypical drama um, about working class people, um, we have a precinct, we have a McDonald's, we have a Ladbrokes, we have a cash generator, and we have a market that is on three times a week, and it's brilliant. One other thing people don't know about it is we've got all these, it's quite, it's a very sort of urban area, but we've got a brilliant park. Um, so I, as I say, I grew up on the border of Harpe and Blakely and the park that is in Blakely is called Boggart Hole Clough, which is a really unusual name. Um, so Boggart is an old Lancashire word for a ghost. So when I was a kid, we used to, I lived in a house that the park backed onto, you'd go out the backyard and you'd be in the park and it was amazing. Um, so we'd spend loads of time in there and then one day we got a bit, we were like, why is it called Boggart Hole Clough? So we did a bit of research and we found out the ghost story of Boggart Hole Clough. So there used to be a farmer who used to live in the clough and he was called Farmer Bell. And he and his family lived there and all of a sudden the mischievous Boggart decided to haunt them. So a boggart is like a bit like a poltergeist. It's a bit of a cheeky ghost. It's a bit naughty. It'll pull covers off beds and stuff like that and grab your feet and things like that. And it also do nice things as well. Like it churn the milk for the morning um, and it'd do some tidying up on occasion. Um, so it wasn't all bad. But the Bell family got really sick of it and they decided to move. And they uh, packed all the stuff up and they moved as they were leaving to their new house. They realised that the boggart had gone with them. So they actually moved back to the farm in Boggart Hole Clough um, and they stayed there because they knew they couldn't get rid of the boggart. Uh, and I, when I found this out as a kid, I thought it was, I didn't think it was a charming, cute story. I thought it was absolutely terrifying. But we used to spend pretty much every weekend in the clough, going around looking for the boggart. Um, and it was just a really nice place to, to grow up. And it's so funny because I always think when people aren't from Manchester or the North, they assume it's just still like the Victorian days with factories and chimneys and stuff like that. In actual fact, we've got some really nice places there. Uh, and in fact, my test is if, if someone says they're from North Manchester, I always like to check if they've got a photograph of themselves 
on the lions outside Heaton Hall in Heaton Park. Because if they haven't, they are not from North Manchester. Thank you, everyone. Uh, that was Harriet Dyer, Dan Nightingale, Justin Morehouse and Rachel Fairburn there. Uh, we've had some uh, a great shout out for uh, Brooks in Dalton Square, Lancaster, uh, talking about dodgy clubs in the north. Uh, and Vicky responds to uh, Alan Carr saying, uh, I'm loving watching this away from home, but it's making me even more homesick. Although Alan Carr is right, my car insurance went down 70 quid when I moved to Lincoln. So, you know, you try and celebrate the region and you end up having a lengthy discussion about car crime. Um, but she says, I would take the increased car insurance to be back in Manchester any time. And y you can't get a better endorsement than that. I mean, you can, but let's not go into that now. Uh, someone says, I know you're a bit busy at the moment. Could you say hello to Amy, Annie and Amy in Carnforth? I almost did, didn't I? I got one of the names wrong and there was only two. Um, and we have uh, someone watching from Hull, uh, Simon with his wife Carol and the lad Fraser, home of the best comedy talent. Don't start. We've been very nice. Nobody's been rude to Yorkshire yet. It's arms across the Pennines, uh, but he's donated to the Just Giving page, so I'm obliged to, to thank him and to read it out. And Melanie, who has donated and is watching from Oman, so thank you very much to that. I have to say hello to Max, uh, who is currently at uh, LRGS, which is the school I went to. Um, Catherine says, please could you say hello to Max, because he'll be mortified. So again, we're trying to celebrate... You don't have to make these messages to upset people. Uh, he's a year 11 student who hasn't done his GCSEs as well. Uh, so is Charlie and Jensen. I, I think that's, you know, my worry with that is it rewards the students who've put the work in early doors. And um, you might think I was one of those, but I really wasn't. And happy birthday to Andy Wright from Huddersfield. And the people donating, I have to thank you so much. We're over 18,000 now. It's absolutely phenomenal. Uh, Annika Caswell, I can't give much as I'm a broke uni student, but love from Canada. It's not about how much you give. It can be, you know, it can, it can be a pound. It can be 50p. If you've got nothing, give nothing. But if you can afford anything, the charities tonight will make good use of every penny. So uh, thank you massively for everything you've donated. We've seen uh, a number of uh, the comedians from the region. The comedy in the region goes back much longer than we've seen tonight. We have some of the greatest legends of all time going back to the, the music hall era and uh, beyond. We're going to pay homage to some of those in a section we've got coming up, which I'm calling the legend section. It's some of the footage I'm most proud of that we've managed to assemble tonight. Some of it is absolutely one-off stuff um, that you will have never seen before, nobody's ever seen before. We've managed to get stuff together that I think is absolutely phenomenal. Uh, before that, because we're on lockdown, um, you can't have an event without some sort of online quiz. This is just for fun, uh, and it's also to showcase some of the finest sporting talent uh, which we have in this region. We have uh, five questions coming up. They are from, let's be honest, some of the finest athletes there are on the planet, uh, never mind just here and now. We have had, uh, we were supposed to have one of the players from the Sale Sharks read the first question, uh, Marlon Yard. Uh, we've been unable to get that video. So I'm going to read question one, and you'll just have to imagine that I have the physical presence of a rugby league player. So it might be best to look away from your screen while I read the question and just imagine that I'm an athlete absolutely in my prime. So there are five questions. What's also exciting is there are five questions. If you have to Google one of the answers, that's not a massive problem. The real quiz is what is the thing that links all the five questions? There is a Lancastrian link to all five questions. And that's as an homage to all the Richardson family Christmases that have been ruined by the game Linky. Um, so question one, I'm going to start off and then I'm going to pass the baton on uh, to an amazing rostrum of sporting talent. And question one is, who was the first Sale Rugby League player to take part in an international test match? And I give you four options for those of you who aren't familiar with your early 20th century Sale Rugby League history. <laughs> and who isn't? Uh, is it A, P.H. Davies? Is it B, Claude Davy? Is it C, George Isherwood? Or is it D, Wilf Woolley? And that's right, I said Wilf Woolley. Um, it's no Hannah McGranahan, but it's a good name and it's in the quiz. Uh, so P.H. Davies, Claude Davy, George Isherwood, or Wilf Woolley. Uh, soon I'll talk more about my time playing for the Sale Sharks and what it's went to me and some of the worst injuries I've had and given to other players who crossed me. Uh, but to carry on with the rest of the quiz, here are some of the greatest names we have. Here's a cheeky little question for you. Which iconic performer made their stage debut at the Morecambe Winter Gardens? 
Was it A, Sir Ian McKellen? Was it B, Thora Heard? Was it C, Julie Walters? Or was it D, Sarah Lancashire? Hi, my name's Charlie McGrew and I play for Blackburn Rovers. I hope you enjoyed tonight's show. My question is, how many times has Royal Lytham and St Anne's Golf Club held the Ryder Cup? A. Never B. Once C. Twice or D. Three times Hi everyone, it's Sarah Story here. I hope you're having an absolutely fantastic evening and raising lots of money for so many great causes. If there's one thing I like to do, it's riding around on my bike. But which British Olympic cyclist was educated at Lancaster University? Was it A, Jason Queeley, B, Victoria Pendleton, C, Chris Hoy, or D, Chris Boardman? Hi, hope you're all safe and well. I'm Jimmy Anderson, an England cricketer and a proud Lancastrian. And I've got a question for you. My football team, Burnley FC, have got a current and a former England goalkeeper in their squad. But what cricketing offence led officials to ban Joe Hart in 2009? Was it A, sledging, B, ball tampering, C, aggressive pointing, or D, throwing the ball at an official? So there we go. Those are your questions from amongst others, Britain's most successful ever female Paralympian and the leading wicket taker in uh, test cricket. Um, it's been pointed out to me that Sail Sharks are a rugby union team and not a rugby league team. And I would like to apologise to all uh, my fellow players at the Sail Sharks um, for what was a genuine error. I am sorry. See how easy it is. I'm sorry. I made a mistake. I know it upset some of you. I'm sorry. I hope we can move on. It wasn't uh, within the rules what I did I just got it wrong I'm so sorry anyway those are your five questions what links the five questions the answers will be coming up uh, at the end of tonight's show uh, this is now we're moving into the legend section we have clips now that I, I honestly didn't think we'd get we uh, we're going to see uh, Zoe Ball and her father the legendary Johnny Ball uh, we're going to see John Thompson uh, who, of course, is a, an icon of comedy and worked alongside uh, Caroline Ahern, sadly no longer with us. And we start with Kate Robbins of the Robbins dynasty, uh, Lancastrian-linked legends. She has done a video, which I don't know if you've seen. Uh, it's, uh, it's a medley of songs performed as Victoria Wood. Victoria Wood, one of the uh, legends no longer with us. I asked if she would mind recording it for us. I, this format which I stole from my friend Mark Oliver um, in Bristol, exists because I don't think it's fair to ask comedians and people whose livelihood is their work to give away uh, what they do for a living. And I didn't want to say to people, do material, give me a piece of your work, because they need that to earn their livelihood. Kate's the exception where I said, this is so good, I just please want to be able to show it to as many people as possible. Uh, and she has recorded it for us. It's one that, when it came in, I watched it five times that day, I've watched it every day since. I think it's one of the funniest things out there at the moment, and it leads on to some absolute icons. Uh, so enjoy this section, and I will see you on the other side. Hi, I'm Kate Robbins. This is my tribute to Victoria Wood, and it's Victoria Wood singing Bond themes. <laughs> Thank you. 
to the good people of Lancashire. This is John Thompson saying hello on a bank holiday weekend. Um, just thought I'd like to say hello and uh, hope everyone's coping in the lockdown. I'm fine. Uh, um, I'm sure other people aren't so fine, but I'd like to think that I can give some positive energy to this message that will cheer you all up and give you some tips. Uh, my tips are don't follow sport, which is great because I hate sport and there isn't any. Don't read a newspaper or watch the news. Another thing. And make sure you have a daily walk, even if it's raining. There's three top tips for you. OK, um, I've been asked to uh, ask why I love the North West. Well, I was born here and I, I grew up here and I love it. And if I could sum up uh, the North West, uh, Lancashire, Manchester in three words, it would be cheap friendly and inclement and I, I wouldn't change it for the world. I did do a, a little stretch down in London but it doesn't, it just doesn't compare. I just love the friendliness of people especially in a crisis. We're brilliant, we're just great, we help each other out. Can you do me a favour? Yeah all right no problem, that's what I love about us. So I've been doing a few daily messages, uh, um, no not daily but I've been doing a few messages on, 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 uh, on various platforms and I thought um, I would do a similar thing that I do on there. Uh, I do dad jokes, uh, I'll get to them. I do a word you should know, and I do uh, Dalai Lama's quotes. So today's Dalai Lama quote is, do not be seduced by worldly values. Materialism does not foster the growth of morals, compassion, and humility. There you go. And the word of the day, I love this word, it's great. This word is ribald. Ribald. I never quibbled if it was ribald, said the satirist Tomler in his song Smut. Uh, ribald is never far removed from smuttiness. The difference perhaps is that smut is mildly offensive, whereas ribaldry is rather fun. Disrespectfully amusing is what ribaldry is. Well, I won't be ribald today. I've got some jokes for you. Um, what's white and fluffy and beats its chest and swings from tree to tree? That's in a meringue tang. Um, a bloke goes to the doctors, the doctor says, that's going to need stitching, you know. He said, he said, oh, I'll be able to do that. He went, suit yourself. Get that. And uh, what was the other one I read? Oh, <sighs> I can't remember. I'm so sorry. I'm getting old now. And I'm in lockdown, uh, beard and hair mode. I'm growing it. I've not had it cut. And uh, this look is called Castaway, if you're interested uh, to uh, emulate this. So, uh, happy Bank Holiday Monday, people of Lancashire, have fun, enjoy yourselves, don't get down. The most important thing in the lockdown is count your blessings. All the best. What do you think of the show so far? Lancash! <laughs>
But my parents came from Lancashire, and every year we used to go on holiday, first to Bolton and then to Blackpool for a week. And it was in Blackpool that we found a book of monologues by Marriott Edgar. And I loved them. In fact, for the next two years, I'd learnt them all. And I can recite them all, even today. The most famous one is Albert and the Lion, but he gets deaded. So I'm going to give you today the return of Albert. <clears throat> You've heard how young Albert Ramsbottom at zoo up at Blackpool one year with his stick with horse's dead antle give a lion a poke in the ear. Well, the name of the lion was Wallace and the poke in the ear made him wild. And before he could say, Bob's your uncle, he'd up and he swallowed the child. He was sorry a minute he did it because with children, he'd always been chums. And besides, he'd no teeth in his noddle and he couldn't chew out with hot gums. He felt little lad moving inside him as he lay on his bed of dried ferns. It might have been little lad's birthday. He wished him such happy returns. Albert kept punching and struggling till Wallace who was feeling bad. He realised it was time he started to stage a comeback for little lad. So with his head down in a corner, on his front paws he started to walk and he coughed <coughs> and he sneezed and he gurgled till Albert <coughs> shut out like a cork. Wallace felt better directly, and his figure once more became lean. The only difference with Albert is his hands, knees and face were quite clean. Meanwhile, Mr and Mrs Ramsbottom had gone on to tea feeling blue. Ma said, oh, I feel down in the mouth like Pa said, I, I bet Albert does too. It just goes to show you, said Mother, as the future is never revealed. If I'd known we were going to lose him, well, I'd have not had his boots sold in eel. Let's look on the bright side, said Father. What can't be helped must be endured. Every cloud has a silver lining, and we did have our Albert insured. Just then, there were a knock at front door, as father these kind words did speak. And when they looked, it went man from Prudential. He called for their tuppence per person per week. Well, when Pa saw who it was who had been knocking, he laughed, and he kept laughing so, till the fellow said, what's to laugh at? He said, you'll laugh at all when you know. Excuse him for laughing, said Mother, but really things happen so strange. You see, our Albert's been et by a lion, so you've got to pay us for a change. <laughs> come, come, said Mam from Prudential. Let's try to understand this. Are you trying to say as you've lost him? Pa said, oh no, we know where he is. When they explained what had happened to Albert, the fellow took out his purse in two ticks, and he paid them with interest and bonus the sum of nine pound, four and six. Pa had scarce got his hand on the money. When a face at the window they see, Mother said, Hey, look, it's your Albert. And Father said, Aye, it would be. Albert come in all excited and started his stories to give. And, and Father said, I'll never trust lions again. I will not. Not as long as I live. Then giving young Albert a shilling, he said, Here, pop off back to the zoo. Here's your stick on the horse's handle. Go and see what tigers can do. I mean, how good was that? Um, I think that Kate Robbins piece is exceptional. Um, I reached out to Zoe Ball, uh, hoping she'd tell me something about um, Blackpool, and she delivered a piece that people of my generation who love Johnny Ball um, will have found very exciting. And reading a, a, an epic poem that I've loved for many years, Albert and the Lion. And we had uh, playing Eric Morecambe there was my friend Bob Golding, who, if you were able to see the theatre production of a show called Morecambe, um, he played Eric in that. I went to see it three times. I grew up uh, between Lancaster and Morecambe, um, flitting between the two. My dad uh, is Morecambe, my mum is Lancaster. We've managed to make it work. Um, and uh, it's, it's, it's for my family, really, that we do the, the Winter Gardens gig because it's a very special venue. And when I grew up in Morecambe, it had Bobbles, uh, which was a theme park. And a scarred in my mind from Russell Howard telling me it sounded like an old lady who used to sit on the seafront and spit at children. And Bubbles! Um, but Bubbles was a wonderful uh, water adventure land. We had Frontierland, we had going theatres, and they've all just been taken away from Morecambe. Uh, so when we do the Winter Gardens gigs, it's to raise money for the hospice and to regenerate that theatre because the people who live there deserve good entertainment and they shouldn't just be allowed to have a theatre like that taken away from them and one person who came to every gig was my uh, uncle robert who uh, lived in lancaster all his life loved it and uh, uh, taking him backstage at the winter gardens was one of the highlights of my career um, and the last time he uh, came with me stood outside the theatre and he looked at me and said I just want to see it how it was in my lifetime and I don't think I ever will and sadly he was right he passed away two years ago 
he didn't get to see it regenerated. But the care he got at the end was from St John's Hospice, who are one of the charities that I'm asking you to donate to tonight. They're a phenomenal hospice. They do phenomenal work um, day in, day out. On lockdown, they're continuing to do what they do. So the next video is uh, it's a charity video from the hospice. Uh, if you feel anything and you haven't so far, and I hate repeatedly begging for money from people, who are having a hard enough time of it. But if you can donate even a pound or two to the Just Giving page, it would mean the world to me uh, and it would be in honour of my uncle Robert. Here's a video from the St John's Hospice. St John's Hospice holds a special place in the hearts of the people of Lancaster, Morecambe and the surrounding areas, providing palliative care for patients at the end of their lives and supporting their loved ones through the hardest time of theirs. With the coronavirus pandemic, the world ground to a halt. But like hospices everywhere, the staff at St John's keep marching on, providing excellent, compassionate care to those who need it. I have been under the care of the hospice since when I was discharged from hospital and told there was nothing more they could do for me. I never knew half of what the hospice did. And then when, of course, everybody had to shut down, um, they've still come here with all the gear on, the protective gear, and they still come. And I have had my eyes opened by how much the hospice does for people like me. It costs a staggering £12,000 per day to keep St John's Hospice running, and only one third of that comes from government funding. The other £9,000 comes from direct donations from the community and from what is usually a jam-packed calendar of fundraising events. By tonight's show, the comedy show live without the audience, John and friends are doing this all for free. Therefore, every penny we raise tonight is going to go back to your community and to helping the charities that really need it the most, especially so that we can continue providing our services. St John's Hospice even let my grandpa's best friend, Finn, who's a dog, into the hospice. And that made him feel much better having Finn there. Please donate as much as you can. Every penny makes a difference. And Buddy says thank you too. <laughs> Please enjoy the rest of the show. Please donate and thank you to everybody who has made this event tonight possible. We want to say a massive thank you to all those who bought a virtual ticket in advance and to those donating throughout the show and afterwards. And wherever you are in the world, if you can, please support your local hospice. They need your help right now more than ever. They need all the money that they can get. So if you can help, please do help. Thank you. We just want to give a massive shout out to John Richardson for all the great work he's doing tonight. Because we know how hard fundraising can be. So thanks John for all that you're doing. And for proving to us once and for all that you can clearly marry a woman way out of your league. Uh, thank you, Lucas. Um who asks how did our marriage to how did our marriage how did I how did how hello we're not live are we how did I manage to marry someone out of my league well the best person to answer that is the person I married who's out of my league um I thought I'd zoom call my wife uh, halfway through the event to see how she's coping it's her first evening without me on uh, lockdown we've been together for the last two or three months <laughs> How are you coping, Lucy? Not well, it seems. What are you doing? <laughs> what are you doing? Who am I? Who are you? I don't know. You're not the person I married. Um, I suspect you think you're Donald Trump. No, do anything. Who am I? I don't know. Stan Laurel? No, yeah, he's from Lancaster. Yeah, he's from Ulverston, I think, nearby. Yeah. Does it suit me? 
Not really, no. I think it's going to have consequences for the sort of already diminishing sexual element of our marriage. Do you want to... Um, it's not something I'm used to saying, ladies, uh, on the internet, but do you want to whip it off for me? So we can have a conversation. I don't oh, please think say you can get it off, because otherwise... I, I, there's nowhere I can go. We're on lockdown. Are you going to leave it like that, coquettishly? That's not freaky at all. Thanks so much. Um, Lucas wanted to know... It was going all right, yeah. We were having a good time. And uh, I thought, do you know what? Bit of light relief. Lucas has asked a question of my wife. Why don't we mm -hmm. get her on the line? And it's becoming increasingly obvious that tactically that was an error. What's he called? Lucas? Yes, he wants to know how I was able to get you. Um, money. You... <laughs> <laughs> okay. Are you all right without me? We've been together every night for the last few months. He sounds quite young, Lucas. He is, yes. He'll have to say, but were he, if he wants... If, if he, he wants, wants a, a woman a like you. Right. Does he want me to read him um, a book? I've got a book here. Why have you got our daughter's toilet training book out? All I said was, is it all right if we give you a quick chat? <laughs> just because just I think it's weird if I answer that question on my own. And currently you've... Well, I don't know what you think you've done. Well, no, this is an important book to read for... To, Especially for parents with young kids, John. Because it, it, I don't want them to make the same mistake I made when I bought it. Because obviously it was when she was having a bit of trouble, wasn't it, on the but, toilet. Yeah. And and so I got it off Amazon. And, and what's quite apparent is sometimes on Amazon, some books are self-published. And it's hard to tell which are self-published. And this one, come out Mr Pooh. And I got it, do you remember, I was really excited and we opened it and I read it to her and I really wish I'd have checked through it first. And this is, um, this is by, can you see here? This is by Janelle and it's illustrated by Jez. Now, I suddenly realised halfway through, I think what's happened is Janelle was married to Jez and then they've had a messy divorce and she's had a breakdown and she's I don't thought, think a messy divorce is the right terminology to use in a book about come out Mr Pooh and she's thought oh I'll write a book about Pooh do you want me to read you it I sort of think you should read some now it, it feels like we can't really come out of it there you've just alluded to the divorce of two strangers well you're over by about three minutes um, but Smith. by all means read this child potty training Kim book Kim Cattell been on yet has Kim Kachal been on yet? No, we're sort of... We're, we're leaving that as a big surprise at the end. But um, <laughs> thanks for that. Um, it gives you hope, though, doesn't it? I can't believe she's from Liverpool. Are you going to read this poo book so I can get on with the rest of my I life? Can, I could end up in Hollywood then, couldn't I, if she has? You could, yeah. Is this, is this what this is about, that you think Hollywood directors are watching? I'm learning to go to the toilet. I don't like sitting on the loo. But mum says I can get a chocolate if I do a poo. And there she is, look, dangling the chocolate above his head. Most hygienic to eat in the toilet, I find. Especially yeah, brown sticky substances. No confusion could possibly happen there. I have learnt to do my wheeze okay, but poos, they're another matter. Poos mean less time for me to play and stuck inside make me feel fatter, Jez. You never took me anywhere. So let the message to her ex-husband. How long is this book? Is it sort of, is it, are we talking Lord of the Rings here or have we got like a couple more pages left? A couple more pages. Okay, mate. Thank you. Today I have a sore tummy. I'm not really feeling so well. This was the bit that I thought, oh God, I should have read it before. I go and find my mummy one look and she can tell. Look at that, she's not turned round. And she's, she's cooking a, a salad as well. That's no, she's got a pie. sign of a breakdown, isn't it? She's smoking a pie. She said, You still have poo inside. You have been holding on. This is something I cannot hide. I wish it was all gone, Jez. And there she is. Look. Can you see him? Look, he's full. Yeah, he's full there. of poo, isn't he? Yeah. Does it come out at the end? This is the bit now, this this, this is going to scare her for that. Can you see that poo look, John? Is that the poo in the toilet? Jez yeah. has put hair on him. Right. Why is he giving him hair? 
I don't know. It's probably a question for sort of when I next see you. It feels like a conversation we could have had. Mum said, you know how to push it out. This will make you feel better. Don't be scared. No need to shout. I know. I'll read you this letter. Oh, my God. My name is Mr. Pooh, and in water I like to swim. Push me out into the loo and watch me swirl around the rim. Well, it's been lovely to catch up. Um, <laughs> you'll probably be in bed when I get back. Um, in the, I'll probably I'll swing by in about 25 years. Okay. Okay, thanks, thanks for being here. See you later. Bye, Archibald. Bye, Lucy. Take care. Thanks for that. Bye. Bye. So, Lucas, I don't know if that answers your question <laughs> about, about how a, a monster such as I managed to ensnare. Um, the siren that is Lucy Beaumont. I think, you know, you, you can sense coming off the screen there some of the raw sexual magnetism that we share. And um, p- perhaps a bit graphic for this feed. I didn't mean to share so much. Um, what a special thing. And um, I'll be honest, this feed was due to be about two hours. And I think now I might just continue it on for as long as I can so I don't have to go home because something's clearly happened. Um, one thing we have this evening is um, we talked earlier about uh, the hospice and we've talked about trauma and uh, I do genuinely believe that in these times we are brought together more than I, if you look at the news at the moment you'd be led to believe that we're all against each other I don't think we are I think um, we have an example in Manchester it's, it's three years and anyone who's watching the United We Stream will have seen the amazing anniversary they did of the uh, Manchester Arena bombings last week a, a phenomenally touching evening and off the back of that Manchester came together and I think we all came together and one of the unifying images of that was by the artist Amy Coney uh, who designed the the B image that we all became familiar with and she has done for us a one-off bespoke piece of artwork um, I can't believe we've got it but on the stage here is uh, a one-off piece by Amy you'll see there the bees running through it we've got the Lancashire rose there and the outline of the county of Lancashire and made up of uh, a series of images with face masks on. So it's it's a proper one-off. It's it's about unification, it's about the county, it's about lockdown. Um, It can be yours, we're going to auction that off. Uh, And rather than have it simply for the highest bidder, which I think would preclude most people from having a chance of owning that, there are details online now, and I think on your screen of Uh, an auction where you can donate a small amount and enter the raffle for that. If you want to donate that amount five times, that counts as five entries into the raffle. So if you really want it, obviously donate more. I think I've I've seen it up close. It's an absolutely stunning piece uh, and it can be yours. So uh, the details are online of that. We're going to move on now. Um, It's been an interesting old section, getting uh, slightly upset about my uncle, then laying bare to you all the clear demise of my marriage and then trying to pull all that back together by offering you a painting. Um, I don't know if it's entirely worked. I would never compare like this in a live gig. This is what's called passing an absolute turd of a room on to the next act. I basically stunk the room out, and then I say to another comedian, you fix that. I'd never do that live, but I am doing it here. Unfortunately, I'm handing on to, frankly, some of the best in the business. You're about to see Jack Whitehall, Jason Manford, Tez Elias, and we're going to start with... uh, Dave Gorman, who is going to talk about these unifying themes where comedy and tragedy come together. Hello, Dave Gorman here. I wanted to talk to you about Manchester, which is why I've used my state-mandated exercise to come here to Wernless Low in the Pennines with the stunning views across the whole of the city. It always makes me emotional looking out at this vista. If you look carefully in that direction, you can actually see where I did my first ever gig brings back a lot of memories for me. Manchester was a very uh, formative part of my life. I lived there for a a good 10 years. It still feels like home when I'm on tour, when I go there. It is still the the one journey that always makes me feel like I'm going home. And the story I wanted to share with you, which has a few dated references in, but I think we'll be okay. Uh, It goes back to 1996. And it's one of the reasons that I know Manchester's gonna be okay through all of this, because uh, I was there in part of Manchester when, when the bomb went off in the Arndale Centre in 1996. I actually wasn't there that day, I was on tour. That's one of those dated references. I don't know if you remember, uh, there was a time where people used to go to different theatres and everyone would congregate and watch a show together. 
It was a weird time. Anyway, I was on tour in 1996. I was driving and my phone started ringing. And 1996, not many people had my phone number. It, having a mobile seemed quite exotic in 1996. So I, I knew it was important. I pulled over and I could say it was my mum who'd been calling me. And that meant it was very important. And my mum said, are, are you okay? I said, well, yeah, I'm fine. Why? What's the problem? She said, oh, there's been a bomb in Manchester. That's how I found out. My heart stopped. I was suddenly thinking about all the people I knew and loved at home. So I reassured my mum I was fine. I said, no, like, I'm on tour. I'm away from home at the moment. I'm, I'm on the road. Now I know with hindsight, I should have called my dad. My parents had divorced. He would have been worried as well. But I didn't. My, my first thought was for the people in Manchester that I know and love. So I picked up the phone and made a few phone calls. One of my friends had been there, had been in, involved, but they, luckily they were fine. They cut a bit of a scrape, but they were, they were okay. That occupied a lot of emotional energy, all those phone calls. When I'd done all that, Instead of calling my dad, I thought, oh, I'm going to be late for the gig. I better get going. So I got back on the road and, and I completed my journey. I was away from home for about five days, I think. So I came home to Manchester five or six days later and I walked into my flat and I saw my answering machine. It's one of those dated references. It had a little red flashing light on it. I hit play and it was my dad. And my dad's message went, hello, David, it's your father. I'm just calling because there's been a bomb in Manchester. Hope you're okay. I won't call you mobile, it's quite expensive. Still, no news is good news. Bye. No news is good news. Yeah. That says more about my dad than Manchester, but you know, it's a story. Anyway, I think my state mandated walk is over. I'd better go home. Who am I kidding? I cut my wife's hair last night. I sleep here now. Bye. Yes, thank you, thank you, thank, thank you for that wonderful introduction. Yes, it is I, Tez Elias, live on the streets of Blackburn. I say live, it's pre-recorded, but thank you for that wonderful round of applause to introduce me. I felt like an NHS staff member, I felt like a doctor or a nurse out there risking my life. It's brilliant, all I'm doing is sat at home. You know what, though, it makes me think, because I'm fully unemployed now, absolutely stuffed. No work, this is about as good as it gets for me right now, pre-recording something outside my house. But every comedy club's been closed down, every theatre, every TV production, every radio production, everything's been closed down. The people who are going to work, though, are doctors and nurses. And it makes me think, my mum was right. I should have got a proper job. I should have become a doctor in it, because at least now I'd be going to work. The thing is, if I was going to work, though, I'd be risking my life. And right now, I feel pretty safe. Uh, just being up here, on here, the biggest hazard is that I might fall off this. So actually, who's laughing now? Hopefully, you guys. And also me, because I'm not out there risking my life being a doctor. I'd right, be clapping for all these doctors and nurses and key workers, but why aren't we clapping for the real heroes? Me. Maybe you as well. The people sat at home making sure that this virus doesn't spread. We're the real heroes in this, because if we stay at home, then the doctors and nurses won't have to risk their life. So who's the real hero now? It's a bit chicken and egg, isn't it? It is really hard to stay at home. I'm so bored. Because all we have at home now, I'm going, I'm going out my mind, because all I have is Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, TikTok, YouTube, Disney+, Plus, Netflix, Amazon Prime, Zoom, and House Party. So there's literally nothing to do. The other thing I wanted to say was, oh bro, do you mind I'm just doing a, a little video? No, don't walk, this is my work environment, you can't walk past it and also we'll be breaking social distancing rules. Just stay where you are, walk around, go on, walk around, go on. Yeah, that's it, keep going. Ah, bro. Heckless. I thought I wouldn't have that problem doing this. One thing I'm grateful though, is that I'm stuck at home during this whole pandemic with my mum. That is honestly an Allah send. That is an absolute godsend. Because my mum's the best in it. She does everything for me. She cooks, she cleans. She, it's basically like, I'm, it's like being in a retreat. People pay thousands of pounds for this sort of stuff. And I'm just having to do it because the government told me to do it. It's not a bad life. My biggest fear is that my mum gets the virus and she's in bed for a few days because that, that means I have to get off my ass and actually do my own cooking and cleaning. And that's my biggest fear. So I'm self-isolating her for my own good. Thank you for listening. I've been Tez Elias. Enjoy yourselves, stay safe, stay at home, and hopefully when this is all over, I'll see you live. Peace. Big Man City fans in our house. So when my wife Sharon came home with two budgies, both light blue, naturally, I call one of them Manchester and one of them City. They were great, they were a right laugh. 
Every evening we'd open a cage and just let them have a fly around the living room for an hour. City was quite shy, so he'd just pop out for a bit and then go back to the comfort of his cage. Manchester, though, like the, like the city itself, was adventurous and exciting and, you know, quite dangerous, really. <laughs> He was a little rebel, and you could not get him back in that cage for all the seeds in the world. Eventually, when he was absolutely knackered, I'd have to pick him up with my bare hands and place him back in the cage. <laughs> it was proper cute. Kids loved it. Ultimately, though, that is what would lead to his downfall. One evening after his lengthy aerial exercise period, he landed on the carpet. His little claw got stuck in the fibres, and our dog Rennie went over, quite a curious mutt, to have a look. She gave him a little tap, only gentle, just playing, you know, she's being nice really, but Manchester went down hard, and you could tell it was serious. He, he wasn't faking it like an Italian footballer, he, he, he would hurt. That's not what killed him though. No, no, no. No, we were quick to action. Manchester was soon in the shoebox, in the car, and on the way to the PDSA. Uh, our garage on housing benefits, so as long as you can pretend to be him, then you can get it for free. A couple of hours later, we're back home. His little budgy leg in a little budgy plaster cast. It was heartbreaking, but it was funny. <laughs> I wanted to get his mate City to sign it with his little budgy signature, but my wife said that I was being silly. <laughs> anyway... He was expected to make a full recovery here. That is until disaster struck. And when I say disaster, I mean my wife. A couple of days later, me and the boys get back from the match. We just hammered Aston Villa 3 0. Beagery, Walsh, Rossler. I was in a buoyant mood, but it was quickly diminished when on entering the house I saw Sharon leaning over the table, crying a little heart out. What's wrong, Mum? said my eldest. Our red-eyed, tearful matriarch looked up from what she was doing and she just burst out crying again. On the table in front of her was a rather sodden and very dead Manchester the Budgie. I put my hand on her shoulder and checked for a pulse. She still had one. But alas, our Budgie friend, he did not. Sharon went to do CPR on his chest with her fingers, but I stopped her and I said, give up, love, he's gone. Well, you could hear the whales down the street. Number 42 asked a few days later if everything was all right, the nosy bastards. I sent the boys to knock on for the mates and I tried to find out what had happened to lead to this sorry state. It turns out Manchester, in his plaster cast, was no longer able to sit on his perch, so my wife was worried he wouldn't be able to drink any water. So she got a little bowl and she put it on the bottom of the cage. Well, the poor little bastard must have fallen in head first and drowned. Horrible way to go. So Manchester's become the very first inhabitant of our very own pet cemetery in the back garden. I think we'll have to get rid of City soon too. It's, it's too many painful memories. You know, he just sits there looking in his mirror, just chatting to his mate. Wife says she feels too guilty every time she looks at him. You know, the other day she was over in the living room she heard the surviving budgie just say, murderer, in a tiny voice. I don't know about that, but I just thought I'd tell you that story because I didn't want his little watery death to be in vain. And also, does anybody need any trill? Manchester! The glorious city of Manchester. Obviously now... I do not live there. I live in London, in a very rough part of London called Notting Hill. But there was a time when Manchester was my second home. Well, not my second home. My second home is technically in Cornwall. My spiritual home. I was a student in wonderful Manchester, in a lovely place called Fallowfield, for three years of my life. And I feel a great affinity to the great city of Manchester. I only have one issue with Manchester and I feel like this is my opportunity to bring this up. When I lived in Manchester, it was like proper Manchester, you know, Manchester. You had your curry mile, where you could eat some filthy lambuna that would leave you strapped to the lavatory for an entire evening and waking up with an arse like the flag of Japan. You had your hippies in the northern quarter, the Affleck's Palace, the weirdest shop I've ever set foot in in my entire life. 
Even the guy that organizes little would walk in there and be like, who the hell laid this out? Your wheel of Manchester. I mean, that was just a joke. Your rip off of the London Eye. The London Eye, which when you get to the top of it, you have panoramic views of the city. St. Paul's Cathedral, the Houses of Parliament. You put yours in a natural divot in the land. Eh, get to the top of Wheel of Manchester. Behold, the roof of the Armdale Centre. Sankey's, best club in the world. No, not best club in the world, mate. Not as good as the Hacienda. Big fish, little fish, cardboard box. Cheatham Hill, all on my threads still from Cheatham Hill. This is legit Dolce and Banana, 100% polyester. But I guess the point that I'm trying to make is that when I was in Manchester, it was still a little bit moody. I leave for five minutes and I am reliably informed that Manchester now not only has an Ivy restaurant, but also a John Lewis. Five minutes, I turn my back on Manchester and you go posh on me. I have never wanted to come back more. And now I can't because of this bloody lockdown. But I guess what I'm saying is that I will be back soon. And it is not just because of the Ivy. It is not just because of the John Lewis. It is also because of the Selfridges and because I love you, Manchester. And we will see each other again, albeit from a safe two metre distance. So uh, everyone uh, involved in that clip, we've had just some phenomenal names. We're at, uh, I'm amazed to say, over £19,000 now uh, of donations so far for the show. So uh, thank you to everyone who's donated. We've had an offer of a substantial amount of money. If I explain why I'm dressed as a half golfer, half pub landlord, and uh, I don't think any explanation is necessary. I think it's just a great look. Um, I think I, I bought the sweater. I was due to have a tour commencing in September, which was going to be called the knitwit. Um, I'm always a fan of knitwear. I'm trying to, since I started working out, I feel the cardigans restrictive of some of the biceps that I've been working on. And it's nice to flash those about, uh, you know, you don't turn up at sail sharks, rugby league squads, uh, training or touch test, whatever they call it. Uh, and thank you to the person that messaged to say the club will be using me as the ball in their next game for confusing the code they play. Anyway, the top half is uh, golfer, the beard, the gut, and the lower half, and the empty bottles around me uh, to suggest the drinking that is why my game never really took off. Um, so we've been holding back. We have a massive secret now, a, a name that none of you expected to appear tonight until about five minutes ago when my wife told you what was going to happen. Um, an international name, somebody who was from our region, moved abroad, became globally famous. I messaged her to say, would you please record a message, expecting, as I do when I text most women, never to be replied to again. Uh, she not only replied, she sent in a message. Uh, I'm incredibly grateful. Here is Kim Katra. Hiya. Um, here with my mum. Hiya. There she is. <laughs> just now. Um, I've been asked by lovely John to contribute a story about Lancashire. I'm not really from Lancashire, I'm from Liverpool, but close enough. Um, this is in support of St John's Hospice and Nordif Robbins Charity, the NHS, the lovely NHS, the gorgeous NHS, and the Lancashire Community Foundation, all fighting COVID-19. Um, so here's my story. Uh, I was invited to go and see a game at Anfield by CBG. And uh, I was thrilled. Uh, I took my cousin, who's a big fan as well, and um, my family. And as we were going in through the turnstile, uh, one of the security guys says, hey love, he says, um, if they don't win today, you can't come back. He says, you'll be a bad penny, you can't come back. So we saw the game, they won over Chelsea, two nil. And uh, as I was leaving, he says, all right, love, you can come back. But I've never been back, I haven't been asked back. Hopefully I will, they're doing so well. Uh, anyway, lots of love to all of you. Be safe, be well, and bye-bye. Mom, I'm finished now. Bye.
Bye. There she is. Bye. I mean, they're widely available, Sasha. So if you really want one, I mean, I'll send you the link. But you know, I think you've got the wherewithal to get. I mean, you're running the nighttime economy of Christ. Sorry, we're back on. Um, that was uh, me auditioning for a movie, Kim. If you're watching, uh, I think you've found a guy who can act alongside you in your next big venture. What a gift to have Kim uh, send us that video. I'm so grateful. A message there for anyone watching from Anfield. You have with you someone who clearly turned things around for you from the lack of success you had before this year. Uh, if Anfield aren't interested, if I could break ranks for a moment uh, and say, Kim, I'm sure you're more than welcome to visit Ellen Road. Uh, if you have the Midas touch, um, imagine that. The combination of Kim Cattrall and Marcelo Bielsa, what could be better? While that video was on, we had a message from someone watching from America um, who wanted to, to thank Kim and to get involved with the night. So uh, we've managed to get them live via Zoom. Ladies and gentlemen, we're nearly at the end of the show. I'm delighted to say, please welcome Mr. President himself. Uh, Donald Trump uh, is with us from the broom cupboard of the White House. I don't want to tell you who I am. That is, that is very confidential. But I, I just want to say you're doing a great job and it's a great honor to be here. Thank you very much. Um, have, you, have you been watching the whole night? No, I don't, I don't tend, to, tend to watch what other people are doing. I just turn up and, and, and get on with it. But I guarantee, I got to be honest, a lot of you British comedians haven't been that good since Bernard Manning. Very good man who talked, I think, a lot of sense. <laughs> Um, perhaps while we've got you here, it's an opportunity for you to talk. I mean, we have people watching right over uh, the United Kingdom and, and abroad. We are in very difficult times at the moment. Do you have any? I mean, you've been quite generous with your advice on what pills we should be taking and things. Do you have any advice? Well, I got to tell you, first of all, the Chinese virus is very bad and you do not want to get it. And people get annoyed with me, by the way, calling it the Chinese virus. But that's what it is. That's where it's from. It's from China. But do they get offended when I call things French fries or Italian food or hardcore German porn? I, that has never been a problem before, but people are getting very offended now, including, I think, a lot of people there. But I've been doing my research into, as you know, I could have been a doctor or an expert, but I've been doing my research into the, and I thought I would share with all you losers in the UK my expertise on the virus. We now know it came into being when a Chinese man was having sex with a bat and the bat became radioactive, somehow we don't know, but then the bat flew away and began biting people and we couldn't find the bat because they can fly, which makes it very hard to get out of and they, they only come out at night, which is when we're sleeping because they're very sneaky things, the bats. But then the bat flew in to a 5G phone mast and died, which is very sad for the bat. But the radioactive bat semen fused with the 5G phone signal. And now 5G phone masts are pumping out radioactive bat jizz. So we, we have to retaliate. I got to tell you, it's very bad. We're going to retaliate towards China. And I want you guys to be part of it. I'm going to retaliate by getting the rock to fuck a bald eagle and throw it at China. <laughs> I mean, it's very rare to be able to say this, but that is the second and most baffling conversation I've had with somebody on Zoom this evening, shortly behind my wife. Um, but I, uh, I guess thank you for joining in. Do you have any uh, message for some of the charities we're raising money for tonight? They're all losers. They don't deserve money. They are taking your money. It is fake news. And I, who are the charities, by the way? I, I, don't, I haven't heard of them. We're Can here you... for St John's Hospice, the Lancashire Community Support Fund, NHS Charities Together, the Manchester Nighttime Economy, Nord off Robbins. Why would you give, I don't understand. Why would you give money to those people? Just to, just to help our, our you know, fellow human beings in, in a difficult time. I think that's a bad idea. I think you should look after yourself only and donate, donate just to yourself. I'm going to look after myself now. I'm going to cut you off. Uh, Donald Trump, it's a pleasure to be able to hang up on you. Um, You're a loser. You're fake news. <laughs> that was, uh, of course, Donald Trump, unless you're going to call me a liar. Um, it was uh, my friend, the comedian uh, Matt Ford, who I'm pleased to have on this. He's not a Lancastrian. He's not really a friend. But um, he has been at every gig. I've done a gig every year for St John's Hospice in Morecambe, and Matt has travelled up every year without fail to raise money. So he is as connected to that gig as I am. I'm not going to imply 
he comes up because my dad invites us afterwards to his local pub and we drink for free to excess into the small hours of the morning. But nevertheless, I'm uh, incredibly grateful to him. We are nearing the end of our night. We have our musical finale, the phenomenal badly drawn boy who has a track for us. But I've left you on tent hooks for this long. It's time now to get the answers for the quiz. And who better to give you the answer than Lancashire's own from the chase is Jenny Wright. Good evening, everybody. It's Jenny Ryan here, the vixen from ITV's quiz show, The Chase. It's that point in the night. I'm sure you're all gagging to know just how well you've done on those quiz questions that have been peppered throughout the show. Who else is better to tell you just how badly you've done than a professional smug know-it-all? So here we go. Question number one. Who was the first sale player to take part in an international test match? Was it Davis, Davy, Isherwood or Wooler? Well, you really had to know your rugby for this one, but you also had to read the question. It was a tricky one. The answer is C, George Isherwood. Although uh, Pat Davis is often credited as being the first international to come from Sale, actually George Isherwood was Sale's first representative in an international test match. He went on tour to South Africa and played all three test matches in 1910, some time ago. Our next guest question was from John McGuinness, the absolute legend of TT. He asked, which iconic performer made their stage debut at the Morecambe Winter Gardens? What a venue. Sir Ian McKellen, Thora Hurd, Julie Walters or Sarah Lancashire? The answer is... It's B, Thora Hurd. Thora was in fact born in Morecambe and her father was the manager of the theatre. So, uh, I mean, he didn't approve of her career that much. So she did very well to get on the bill. Uh, Burnley's own Ian McKellen made his first professional debut at the Belgrade Theatre in Coventry. Julie Walters started at the Liverpool Everyman and Sarah Lancashire started at the fantastic Library Theatre in Manchester. Question number three, we had Blackburn's Charlie Mulgrew and he asked, how many times has the Royal Lytham and St Anne's Golf Club hosted the Ryder Cup? Never, once, twice or thrice. The answer is, it's C, twice. It's 1961 and 1977. On both occasions, the USA prevailed, but the 1977 Ryder Cup was the last time it was the USA versus Britain and Northern Ireland. After that, it was always USA versus Europe, and we started doing a bit better. The fourth question was from Sarah Story. You've had some legends on tonight, honestly. Britain's most successful female Paralympian. You know, she's a very, very keen cyclist, to put it mildly. But which other Olympic champion cyclist was educated at Lancaster University? Jason Queeley, Victoria Pendleton, Chris Hoy or Chris Boardman? The answer is A, Jason Queeley. It's an absolute treasure trove of alumni is Lancaster University. Actor Andy Serkis, author Sarah Waters, news presenter Ranveer Singh, comedian Tez Ilias, who's here, I'm, I'm sure he's, none of you are familiar with him. Uh, the motor enthusiast James May is also an alumnus and the former health secretary Alan Milburn, who is now actually the chancellor of the university. And your fifth question came from yeah, I'm speechless at this legend. It is James Anderson, Lancashire legend, leading wicket taker. Wow. He asked, Burnley FC's Joe Hart was once banned for a cricketing offence. What cricketing offence led officials to ban Joe Hart in 2009? Was it A, sledging, B, ball tampering, C, aggressive pointing, or D, throwing the ball at an official? The answer is, it's A, sledging. What more could it be than that? So we have five questions. You may have got one out of five, zero out of five, five out of five. But what you're all wondering is, what's the link? Have you worked it out? I can give you a little bit of a clue, but if you've not got it by now, you're not getting the points because I'm very strict. Okay, the little clue is this.
Yes, the link is George Formby. The answer to the first question included the word George. George Formby played at the Morecambe Winter Gardens probably many, many times. And he also made a film about winning the TT races. So that was very appropriate for John McGuinness being here. He lived his final years in Lytham St Anne's, where the uh, Ryder Cup was held in 61 and 77. Uh, if there's one thing that I like, it's riding around on my bike. That's actually a lyric from a George Formby song, so I hope you are listening very carefully when Sarah Story asked that question. And this was pretty shoehorned in. There was a question about why they had to ban Joe. Yeah, um, I think it should be ban John from writing links between questions. Um, George Formby probably went sledging, I don't know, but the, the main clue was in the question. In fact, he was most known for playing the banjo ukulele or banjo -lele. That's a proper ukulele. I have a banjo -lele, but this is from about 1933 and it's it's absolute hell to keep in tune so that's why you had it on the proper uke so how did you do i mean those were pretty tricky i think it was more about the quality of the people who asked the questions than uh, the actual success but if you got anything right there a massive pat on the back to you uh, i was asked to take part in the event because i am a proud, proud resident of the Northwest area. I mean, I'm called the Bolton Brainiac on the chase, and I am so proud of being from Bolton, which is, I like to say it's the place of other uh, in Greater Manchester, because anyone from outside the area has no idea where Bolton is. Um, but I feel that we've got the best of both. In fact, way back when, when they were changing the uh, the postal areas, we campaigned to be able to put Lancashire on our letters and immediately forgot about doing that. So 50% of the time we're Greater Manchester, 50% of the time we're Lancashire, and that is the way we like it. We've got all the wonders of being an urban centre. We're virtually joined onto Manchester. Uh, there's, you know, there's nothing green in the way. And yet, if you go the other way, we've got all the wonders of Lancashire all the way up to the lakes. Beautiful scenery. In fact, tonight I've been out looking for owls, like about 10 minutes before I started making this video. Amazing. Uh, it's a wonderful place to be from. We've got the best of culture. So many amazing people are from this area. In fact, just the people who are here are I think they're the best around. So basically, suck it Yorkshire, we're the best. So I hope you'll join me in a very appropriate toast. I've got my vintage Vimto here because that's how proud I am of coming from where I come from. Join me in a toast to our wonderful region. Cheers everybody. Cheers to you. Thank you for that. Uh, well done if you got any of those questions. I apologise for the banjo question. Um, it's been a long week putting these videos together and hectoring people. I'll stress again, nobody who's filmed a video tonight has had anything in return except my harassment on their social media feed at various hours. And I just thought the banjo thing might be funny, but um, I, I remain uh, willing to be corrected on that. We're about to go into our, our final video of the night, after which I will wrap up the evening. You can see on the screen behind me there, uh, we have uh, Damon, badly drawn boy, has not only done this video for us, he has donated this, which is a signed uh, copy of his latest album on vinyl. It's a phenomenal prize. It is available to anyone from now. If you donate this final push, um, we've got a video coming up from uh, our final charity of the evening, which is Nordoff Robbins, who are a music rehab charity doing amazing work. After that, you'll see Damon and you'll hear the track, a very special track that sends shivers down my spine because of the era I grew up in. Um, if you can donate through the Just Giving, make sure you put your name on it. Anyone who donates from now to the end of this video and we see their name, we'll pick a name at random and they'll win this uh, amazing gift that has been donated. Um, so thank you for all your donations so far. If you have anything left to give, now's the time you might uh, win this uh, signed LP as well. So without any further ado, here's, uh, here's a clip from one of our charities tonight, Nordoff Robbins.
Music is everything. It makes you feel really good. It's about love, sharing. That's what I've got from coming here. Music is, I think, a fundamental human right. I think music therapy helps here because it taps into a part of her memory that hasn't eroded yet. The music's been very important to Mum because I just think it brings her back into our world a little bit. There you For some reason, his mind's clicked on in a certain way that it wouldn't have done without the music. There was silence in my house for five and a half years and through music, perhaps he was able to communicate. Because music's such a simple thing, but it's a personal thing. It's little steps all the time. Music therapy has enabled Mary to develop her communication and her social interaction. I'm sure there's a band playing in his head all the time and I want to help him make the music that's in his head. During the session, is a completely different person when he's traveling. It's like having Eddie back to her when she used to be. What you see is that despite illness, trauma, disability, people can always access music. And you start to see self-esteem, confidence, freedom, control, expression, or on one level, social change and how music affects people's lives, but then affects the community that's around that person. But I think what's really profound is that relationship they can foster with music, because that can then last a lifetime. Hello everyone, I'm Damon, Badly Drawn Boy, and it's a thrill for me to be a part of No Audience with John Richardson and friends. Um, not only raising money for St John's Hospice and Nordoff Robbins, but also we are celebrating Lancashire. Uh, I grew up in the great town of Bolton. Uh, my mum and dad are from, dad's from Stockport, mum's from town, like Cholton on Medlock. Uh, I've grown, I've lived in Chorlton for 25 years. You move to Chorlton and no one's heard of Black Peas for a start. Uh, they still haven't. Uh, so I associate Black Peas on Bonfire Night with Bolton. Cars Pasties, Peter Kay, Bolton Town Hall, the Octagon Theatre, Burnham Park, back in the day watching the, the Wanderers, um, Winter Hill. So whenever I go back to Bolton, I get a warm fuzz. My folks still live there. Um, it still holds a special place for me. It's all my early memories that went into my soul uh, as a person. So, um, and I'm gonna play a song to celebrate. Uh, this is one from my debut album, which is 20 years old, a song called Once Around the Block. Thank you, John. Take care. <laughs>
Thank you. Uh, and I can announce that the, the winner of the signed LP is Millie Toll from Scotland. So thank you for your donation and uh, congratulations on your prize. Uh, we've had some uh, donations in towards the end that mean that combined with the money that's been sent in on the text number, we're close to £30,000 for tonight, which is absolutely mind-blowing. I can't thank you enough. Um, the show, when it finishes, will be available to watch uh, on download. If you go to the United We Stream website, you'll be able to watch after the event. If you know someone who you think might enjoy the show, they can watch the link. The Just Giving page will stay live. So let's keep the donations coming in if we can. I have to thank uh, my friend Mark Olver, who came up with the idea uh, for this format of the night, without which uh, we wouldn't have been able to do this tonight. Uh, and we have to thank the team that have put this show together uh, so we have uh, our production director Colin McKevitt, we have Katie Hall Andy Everston, Billy Isles, Matt Bridget, Chris McClung, Jade Rhodes Bethany Hilton, Laura Graham Amy Coney who's done our artwork uh, Andrew Hurst, David and Sophie at St John's, Nordoff Robbins our producer for the show, the amazing Emma Young the theatre here, Andy Burnham uh, Sasha Lord for their support uh, Yvonne is in the room um, we couldn't have done this without any of you so thank you so much Thank you to everyone who has donated videos. I honestly, it's, it's been the worst part for me having to beg favours from people, some of whom like Jimmy Anderson, I admire and I've never met and to contact them for the first time and say, can you do me a favour? They've all done it because they believe as I do passionately in the charities that we've been supporting tonight. So thank you to every one of them. Most of all, first and foremost, thank you to everyone who's watched and donated. None of this has any point and none of the charities work can go on without the money that you have sent. And I'm grateful for every single penny of it. Um, I don't know what else to say. I'm dreading going home. Uh, I'm dreading the end of this because although I'm alone in a the theatre, um, it's been lovely being with you for the last two hours and it's the culmination of weeks of work for all those people behind the scenes. So thank you to everyone. And um, I'm just going to sit here and wait lockdown out, I think. Thank you very much. Hi, everyone. It's Scott McTominay here. Uh, obviously, I'm born and raised in Lancaster, so for me to see what John's doing with, with his show is, is amazing. It's something that's very, very close to my heart as well with, with different charity work and trying to help people in, in general through a very, very difficult time. So no, obviously, for myself, it's just donate as generously as you can. It's all going to an absolutely amazing cause. And for me, it's something that I, I hold very, very close to myself and, and all my family as well. So no, I would just like everybody to have an amazing show, enjoy it, and hopefully lockdown will be finished as, as soon as it can be. So no, stay home and, and stay safe as well.